please welcome Tim Smite. The fall of 1974, let me try that again, way back in the fall of 1974, <laughs> I was a 21-year-old senior in Northwestern. My friend Bob and I were sitting in the dorm lounge one evening watching an old Twilight Zone episode. The story was about a harried New York executive who dies on a commuter train dreaming of an idyllic small town called Willoughby, which turns out to be the name of the funeral home he's taken to. Bob looked over at me and said, don't you know a guy who lives at a funeral home? I did indeed. My friend Bill, a theater major at Northwestern, lived in a rent-free room at a local funeral home in exchange for answering the phone at night. Minutes later, egged on by Bob, I called Bill and told him we were interested in seeing the place. He said sure and to come on over. So just past 10 p.m. on this crisp fall evening, we headed down to the Hebelway Funeral Home. Like most 21-year-olds, aside from those goth types that have always puzzled me, I didn't think about death very often. I'd never even been to a funeral, let alone inside a funeral home. The thought of living in one seemed, well, kind of bizarre, but also cool in, in, in an offbeat way. Free rent was certainly a plus. Anyway, I was always up for a new experience. Bob and I both thought this one would be a fun and revealing one. A 15-minute walk brought us to the front door of an old Gothic-style building. Rang the bell, and moments later, the door slowly creaked open. There stood Bill, clad in a full-length, blood-red bathrobe. <laughs> Welcome to my humble abode, he said with a devilish grin. The foyer was well appointed with plush carpeting, dark wood walls, and a crystal chandelier overhead. Death's opulent reception room. <laughs> Taking this in, I began to feel a little squeamish. The absolute silence of the place heightened my unease. Bill could sense that Bob and I were both a bit unnerved, and thespian that he was, he began affecting a creepy voice and manner. <laughs> We'll begin our tour in the embalming room, he said, leading us downstairs. This is where our guests embark on their final journey. He flicked on the fluorescent lights, revealing a space that was all white tile and gleaming stainless steel. Two operating tables occupied the center of the room. Bill told us the morticians first drained the cadaver's blood, replacing it with formaldehyde. This preserves the bodies, retards rigor mortis, and prevents putrefaction, he explained. Prevents what, Bob asked? Um, unpleasant aromas, Bill said. The team then repairs any damage to the head and hands as, as best they can. They give each corpse a manicure and glue their eyes shut. Finally, they shampoo and comb their hair, apply makeup and dress them in clothes provided by the families. I think I invented the acronym TMI right about the <laughs> Before we move on, Bill said, would either of you like to lie down or... <laughs> Fuck no! <laughs> Back upstairs, Bill led us to the mortuary <coughs> office, where we leafed through a few leather-bound ledgers. The place had been in operation for more than a century. Most of the recently deceased were elderly folks, but it was a different story in decades past. Many of those guests were younger, and some had died in jarring ways. One listed the cause of death as hammer blows to the head. Another said, trampled to death in the stockyard. A third said, killed by the Illinois Central Railroad. <laughs> I wonder how the morticians had fared with those three. Bill next took us to a room where a set of coffins was on display. Struck me as being something like the showroom at a car dealership. The coffins all had names, just like different models of cars. The most expensive one was sheathed in burnished copper, 
with polished cherry wood and purple velvet cushioning inside. It was priced at $10,000 and named the aristocrat. <laughs> I wondered if family members of the deceased were suddenly guilted into upgrading by the sales staff. Did they work on commission? Bill said, maybe, to both queries. <laughs> this fun tour of ours was veering into some dark territory. Finally, Bill guided us through a series of rooms where the deceased were displayed in their coffins at wakes. This is my favorite room, Bill said as we entered one part. I often study in here. The room was ornately furnished with a piano sitting off to one side. Polished oak coffin sat on a pedestal in the rear. On the wall directly behind it was a large painting of a peaceful Walden-like pond with a path alongside it that meandered off into the woods. Bill told us the painting was called The Trail to Eternity. We walked up to the pedestal to get a closer look at this artwork. I wondered exactly what eternity it was supposed to be paradise for the righteous and a fiery inferno for others? Or did the trail simply lead to an empty void for all of us? As I was pondering this, Bill unexpectedly reached down and opened the coffin. Suddenly things got very real. Inside was the body of a woman, lying with her pants folded and eyes closed. Now, this was the first time I'd ever seen a dead body. And it rocked me. For one thing, she looked to be about as young as we were. I wondered how she died. An illness, an accident, suicide, something more sinister. Whatever caused her death, the morticians had done a masterful job. She looked flawless. For several moments, we just stared at her in silence. Man, I finally said, she looks almost before I could utter another word, she suddenly sat up, looked right at me, and said, Ooh! <laughs> Bob and I both leapt back about three feet. Bill and the reanimated corpse erupted in laughter. I wish you guys could see yourselves right now, Bill said. Say hello to my girlfriend, Gwen. <laughs> It was past midnight when Bob and I finally took our leave after a couple of badly needed beers upstairs in Bill's room. When we got back to the dorm, Bob headed off to bed. I sat outside on the front steps for a while, lost in thought. Our tour of Death's Backstage, which I expected would be a playful lark, really had a profound impact on me. And it wasn't just Gwen's jack-in-the-box surprise that joined me. It was the whole unsettling totality of the place, especially that forlorn painting, The Trail to Eternity. I realized that it was actually a trail between two eternities, the one before we're born and then the one after we're gone. Our lives are but a, a brief flicker of light between the two. I vow that from then on I will try not to waste a single second of it. A little stargazing would have provided a fitting capstone to what was a very impactful evening, but a thick bank of clouds had wafted in off Lake Michigan, shrouding the sky in a ghostly mist. Ah, shit, I said to myself, and I headed off to bed. <laughs>